As we have uh, pointed out numerous times from uh, this pulpit, Ephesians chapter 4 is really a transitional uh, section or juncture in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Uh, the reason we can discern that is because now he gets into exhortation. Uh, the first three chapters really is Paul, by way of doctrine, helping them to appreciate what great riches we have come to enjoy in Jesus Christ. But in view of those riches, and now their having appropriated them, and our having appropriated them in gospel obedience, we have a responsibility, a responsibility to walk a manner of life that is commensurate with that, that is reflective of our appreciation and our, our uh, gratitude for what God has done for us in Christ. And so there in chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul begins, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And I suggested this is uh, a, a transitional juncture in the letter because now it becomes very much exhortation. It becomes admonition. It becomes instruction with regards to how a Christian in a practical way ought to walk that worthy walk. And so that really will continue through the remain, uh, remaining three chapters of Ephesians, chapters 4, 5, and 6. I just wanted to give us that introduction because when we get down to chapter 5, we're still in that mode, we're still in that mindset. And so in the closing verses of chapter 4, we can see how that Paul is urging Christians in their walk, uh, again, a walk that has um, come about because of our response to uh, the gospel and our obedience to uh, those terms by which we can have come to enjoy the riches in Christ, uh, we are not to, verse 31, let, or we are to let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and spe uh, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. In contrast, we are to be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Now note, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And so we can see that God and what He has done for us in Christ now becomes not only the, the motivation for our walking this course of life, but even a model, a model by which we are to walk. And so then when we, and, and ignore that chapter break, when we come down to chapter 5, that's the exhortation. Be ye therefore followers of God. The American Standard Version translates that, be ye therefore imitators of God. Once again, God is not only the one who has made all this possible, but He then becomes a model for how we are to then conduct ourselves one toward another, including forgiving one another. But here, it's a more general exhortation. Friends, the old adage, like father, like son, that should be true spiritually. God intends for us as His children, and remember that was one of the great riches that we have come to enjoy in Christ, going back to chapter 1, and there in uh, verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself. And so if you are in Christ, if you are a Christian, having rendered uh, obedience to the gospel of Christ. If you have done that, you are now a child of God. You have become part of that adoptive privilege through Jesus Christ. And so as children, now we have a responsibility. We are to be followers of God. We're to be imitators of God. That entails a lot of things. As we've already alluded to previously, he talked about forgiveness. Just as God forgave us in Christ, we are to be forgiving one another. But having offered that exhortation to be followers of God as dear children, notice what he follows that up with, verse 2, and walk in love. That shouldn't surprise us as children of God because our Father is actually the very essence of love. He is love. 
according to 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, and again verse 10. Prior to that verse, uh, verse 8, we read this, Beloved, let us love one another. Here's why. For love is of God. Now notice, everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Friends, if we take the converse of that, that would suggest that if you do not love, well, then you are not born of God. You do not know God. Regardless of what claims that you would make for yourself with regards to your relationship to God, love becomes a litmus test, if you will, determining whether our claims to be a son or daughter of God, to know God, is true. Because John is arguing, saying that if you really know God, if you are a child of God, you must know love. Because God is love. And so again, coming back here to Ephesians chapter 5, in a similar way, Paul is exhor exhorting us as Christians, as children of God, follow your Father. And that is going to demand that you walk in love. How did Jesus manifest that? As Christ has also loved us and hath given Himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling a sweet savor. And so Jesus, God in the flesh, God coming to earth, manifesting for us what a life that is pleasing to God looks like in perfection, Jesus knew His Father. Jesus, as the only begotten Son of God, imitated His Father. And as God, He came to this earth and He walked in love. And so now, as children of God, who claim to be God's children, who claim to know God, we ought to be walking in love. As Jesus' disciples, Christians, we are to be following in His footsteps. And He walked in love. So friends, all of these things, again, should bear upon us the awesome responsibility that we have as Christians to sincerely, Practice love in our walk. And again, it's not just any love. The word here in Ephesians chapter 5, the words there in 1 John chapter 4, all of them are agape love. And that's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about love. And particularly, we've been talking about agape love. And whether or not, as Christians... Those who claim to be God's children, those who claim to be born of God, those who claim to know God, those who claim to be following in the footsteps of Christ, those who claim, make those claims whether or not we show our claims to be true by walking in love, having our lives characterized by agape love. How do we know what that looks like? How do we know what that is in, in you know, practical terms? Well, as we have noted numerous times throughout this study, really is at the very heart of our study, we come to learn that from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, sometimes styled the great love chapter of the Bible. Why? Because it's a chapter focused upon agape love. And not only showing the primacy of it, not only showing the permanence of it, but also showing a very profile of what that agape love looks like. And that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 8. And in an earlier lesson in this series, we suggested that everywhere in this, those verses where you read the word charity, again, agape love, love, you could substitute God's name. And it would be just as true, because God is love. He's the very personification of what it is. And so you could read it this way, God suffereth long. God is kind. God does not envy. God does not vaunt Himself. He's not puffed up. He doesn't behave Himself unseemly. He doesn't seek His own. He's not easily provoked. He doesn't think evil. He rejoices not in iniquity, but God rejoices in the truth. God bears all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. God never fails. But again, if I'm 
supposed to be walking in love, even as Christ did, if I'm supposed to be following my Father, who is the very essence of love, the challenge now comes, can I say that about myself? About these particular virtues of love, what, what love looks like? And that's really been the question that we've had before us through this study. But to try to make it a little more workable and uh, functional by way of uh, answering the question, we decided just to take that first attribute of agape love. Again, verse 4, love suffereth long. American Standard Version says, or in the New American Standard Version says, love is patient. Patient. That's what God is. And that's what we should be if we are genuinely practicing agape love. And so this study has been about the patience of love. We kind of looked at, gained some insight into what that attribute looks like, patience, and particularly the word that is used here by Paul, a word in the Greek that speaks to being long-tempered or to suffer long. He also uh, kind of draws upon that same attribute when he talks about uh, love bearing all things and enduring all things. Also in verse 5, it's not easily provoked. All of these things really uh, are at the, the heart of patience and speak to this particular attribute of agape love. Following that, we looked at some impediments and not in any way to offer excuses for not being patient or practicing the patience of love, but really calling these particular circumstances you know, to our attention so that we would give added focus upon practicing the patience of love during times when it might be a bit trying for us. Uh, when we're tired, uh, maybe it's just a lack of self-control or self-discipline. Uh, it could be because we have unrealistic expectations that might uh, prompt impatience in our dealing with other people. Uh, but we, we dealt with those, and again, that was not in any way an exhaustive list, just some suggestions as to when maybe we need to give extra care to make sure that uh, we're still practicing the patience of love, even during those potential impediments to it. But now we come to the conclusion of our study, and it really gets back to Ephesians chapter 5. We're to be imitators of God. God is love. He's the very essence of love. So God is long-suffering. God is patient, and I'm supposed to be following Him. Christ evidenced love for us. Agape love. Christ is love. Christ was patient and long-suffering. I'm supposed to be walking in His footsteps. I'm supposed to be following Him. And so when we start, again, trying to better understand the patience of love, Aren't we thankful that God has provided for us in Himself and in His Son the imitable patience of love? This is what it looks like in its perfection. Now, we'll never achieve that during our earthly life, but we need to ever be striving toward it, trying to get closer and closer. Just as, uh, you know, children and and you know, with their desire to imitate their dad or their mom. You know, they, they struggle at first, but they, they want to keep making improvements. And so it should be with us. So let's think about God being long-suffering, patient. His actions toward man provide us truly the imitable patience of love. His love, His patience of love. Is perfectly exemplary. It's worthy of our greatest and most diligent effort to imitate. And I think those, again, present here uh, this morning, we all are well aware and I feel confident that we are very appreciative, even indebted to God for His patience of love. But let's very quickly just think about how it is presented in Scripture. First of all, by declaration. By declaration. Friends, God Himself and if you want to know God, if you want to know God for who He is, let God tell us who He is. I mean, that, that's where you get the true 
definition and, and true concept of God is from God Himself. And so you might remember back in uh, Exodus chapter 34 where uh, Moses was instructed to uh, make a second set of to stone ta uh, ta tables or tablets and carry them up to Mount Sinai. And God came down in a shadow, if you will, in the very presence of Moses. And here's what He said to Moses. He said, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, you see, here is God defining Himself, giving Him His own profile of who He is to Moses. And among the things that God says of Himself, He is long-suffering. And you know what? He's already evidenced that, hasn't He? Because you remember why Moses broke the stones, the first set of stones, stone table? is because God's people who had been delivered by God were down at the foot of Mount Sinai while Moses was ascended up to its height to receive that law and they're down there making a golden calf. God has already shown Himself long-suffering. But He's declared it. He's declared it of Himself to Moses. The psalmist also declares this attribute about God. You can read the psalm, but over in Psalm 86 and verse 15, apparently a psalm of David, David says, But thou, O Lord, o Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. The psalmist had come to learn of this great attribute of God. God is long-suffering. It's part of who He is because He's love. And the patience of love is seen in who God is. In the New Testament, let me introduce you quickly to Romans chapter 2 as another declaration of God's being long-suffering. An interesting context, and we're not going to develop it uh, in any way thoroughly, but uh, Paul is now addressing the Jews to help them recognize that like the Gentiles, they also are in need of, of God's of the gospel and, and the provisions that would come through the, the good news, the glad tidings about Jesus Christ. The Jews may have thought because of their being the covenant people of God in the past that somehow they weren't in need of this. And yet Paul would bear out that they were. And to think otherwise, he suggests there in verse 4, might be owing to the fact that they did not have a proper appraisal and understanding in response to God's long-suffering. He says there, as a, a possible reason for their prejudice and their hypocrisy, thinking that God's judgment somehow wouldn't fall upon them if they were guilty of the same sins as those of the Gentiles, he says, Or do you despise the riches of God's goodness and forbearance and long-suffering? The idea of looking down at, not valuing as they should, Paul's asking them, is this prejudice, is this, uh, this hypocrisy on your part, is this owing to the fact that you failed to understand these things about God? His goodness, His forbearance, and yes, His long-suffering. Paul then offers as to why God had shown them His goodness, His forbearance, His long-suffering. He said it was all intended to lead them to repentance. But they had kind of looked down on these things, had not valued them as they should have. Uh, Brother uh, Tom w Waycaster, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but he says concerning this uh, word riches, he says it is a Greek word that signifies wealth or riches, and from it comes the idea of abundance. Abundance. The abundance of God's goodness, the abundance of God's forbearance, the abundance of God's long-suffering. He actually says in relationship to this, Jesus, or excuse me, God's patience is full and long. There's the long suffering of God. It's abundant. It's abundant. And sadly, some of the Jews 
misunderstood that. Well, they weren't alone. It wasn't just among the Jews. In fact, let me now kind of conclude this point by taking you to a verse that clearly tells us about the long-suffering of God by way of declaration. Look over in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. This context has to do with individuals scoffing at God's promise to destroy the world one day and bring about a, a general judgment of mankind. And some of the rationale that they were using is, well, you know, God hasn't done it yet. So why should we anticipate He's ever going to do it? They might have even falsely looked at uh, you know, the events of, of humankind and said, nothing's changed. So why should we think that God is going to destroy the world? Well, Peter's going to argue they are <laughs> obviously... Uh, ignorant of some things. You look back in history, God uh, destroyed the world or destroyed the earth and its inhabitants through uh, a global flood in the past. But then as he continues to answer their, their scoffing about you know, God's destroying the world, he offers them, again, better understanding with regards to how they might have been perceiving this delay as they would have interpreted it. Notice what he says there concerning God. Verse 9, first of all, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise. And the previous verse allows us to understand, you know, God's not on our timetable. And so just because God made a promise thousands of years ago and hasn't yet fulfilled it, that doesn't mean He's not going to fulfill it. That might have some bearing on whether man would fulfill his promises, the lapse of time, but not with God. Time has no bearing on God's keeping His Word. So God, unlike some of us, He's not slack concerning His promise. So what is all this apparent delay, as they would perceive it, what is this all about? That's where Peter explains, God is rather long-suffering to us word. Now listen to this. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Kind of goes back to what we read there in Romans chapter 2. Paul was trying to help them to understand. You might have been interpreting or misinterpreting God's goodness and God's forbearance and God's long-suffering, but what it was designed to do is to give you opportunity to repent. It was actually to be motivation for you to repent. Now Peter further explains the reason God has not yet destroyed the world is because God being long-suffering, exercising the patience of love, is desirous of all coming to repentance. Have you ever given much thought as to who that takes in? All? That all come to repentance? Think about who that takes in. And I'll be honest, you don't have to think far. Because that takes in me. That takes in me. But it speaks to the fact that, see, long-suffering is a lot like mercy. A lot like grace. It's, it's a virtue of love, agape love, seeks the highest good of another. Not because they're deserving of it. And that certainly is the case with regards to man. It's not like man is deserving of God's long-suffering. God's long-suffering extends to all in the sense that He desires for all to come to repentance. And that should help us understand something about this imitable patience of love. Because remember, I'm trying to imitate it. I'm trying to follow that example. And isn't it the case that, friends, when it comes to my being patient with others, it's really no great feat when I am patient with somebody who is well-behaved. When it's a real test is when people are not doing what they should. And that's how God was with His long-suffering. 
God was long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. He wanted all to come to repentance. Again, I, I tend to use my grandchildren a lot by way of illustration because I can really relate to that. Maybe you can't, but I can. And, and you know when I don't have a problem with being patient with my grandkids is when they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. But when they're misbehaving, when they're acting out, when they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, that's when my patience is really tested. That's when I tend to be impatient with them. And yet here is God giving us the imitable patience of love and God's long-suffering is exhibited, it is exercised toward all. Because He wants all men to come to repentance. And that's convicting to me. Because again, when I am patient, is it because the other people are deserving of it? Or is it because I'm practicing the patience of love even toward those who aren't deserving of it. So, by declaration, God declares of Himself. It's evident uh, by others who, by inspiration, had been speaking, God is long-suffering toward all. What about manifestation? Let's quickly look at an example that manifests God's long-suffering, the patience of love. And to do this, let's look at a passage of Scripture, no doubt, that is familiar to us, uh, especially in light of the fact that we've recently had a series on forgiving others. But look over at the, um, the unmerciful servant, parable of the unmerciful servant, taught by Jesus, recorded for us in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And once again, this comes on the heel of talking about forgiveness. Uh, you might remember that Peter had asked Jesus with regards to how often he should forgive, uh, how often his brother should sin against him, and he should forgive him seven times. And Jesus responded, verse 22, I say not unto you until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Let me ask you, does that speak to patience? Long-suffering? Forgiving somebody not seven times, but seven times seventy? But notice then how Jesus illustrates this. He's going to give us a, an illustration, if you will, of what that kind of long-suffering looks like. What, that, what kind of forgiveness. is to be exhibited by Jesus' disciples. Verse 23, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, notice, have patience with me. Be long-suffering, King. Lord, be patient and I will pay thee all. In studying this parable in the past, we've talked about what an unpayable amount of money that would have been for anyone, for any Jew back then. 10,000 talents. But how does the Lord respond? Verse 27, Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Brethren, what a powerful illustration of God's patience of love because that's who the Lord is representing or is, is representing in this parable the Lord or the Master. He's, he's God. That servant didn't deserve the release of that debt. And remember, that servant pictured in this parable is you. It's me. It's all mankind. We're the ones who, because of sin, have incurred this insurmountable debt before God. And we owe it only to His patience of love. That He does not make us pay. 
but is willing to forgive us. But did you remember why Jesus taught this parable? Oh yes, here we have an illustration of God's imitable patience of love. But He taught it to help Peter and to help the other disciples, to help us to understand then that we as His disciples are to be imitating God's patience of love. And we know that because the parable goes on to describe how that this servant who has now been forgiven of this insurmountable debt now goes out, encounters somebody who owes him far less by way of degree, far less, incalculably less. And that fellow servant would ask him to show patience. Look at verse 29, have patience with me. That's what he was asking of him. You remember his treatment. He grabbed him by the throat. He said, you pay me all. Even at that appeal, he took him and he had him incarcerated until he would pay. See, God, yes, he wanted us to see an illustration of his imitable patience of love. But you know why? So that we would imitate it. So that now we would follow that example. That we would show the same long-suffering, the same patience toward others who would offend us, who would incur debts with us. Far less. Far less than what we owed God. Well, then finally, let's talk about the manifestation of this imitable patience of love by God. And I don't know about you, but I stand in all of God's long-suffering when I think about it. I stand in all of it. In His dealing with mankind throughout the ages. So early in man's history, remember what God witnessed among His crown creation? And even in that, even in that, look over in 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter's talking about those who lived during the time of the, of the flood, prior to the flood. And he speaks of them, describing them, verse 20, he says, which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the day of Noah. While the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. What, what was that period of time it was an evidence, a manifestation of God's long-suffering toward rebellious man whose thoughts were only evil continually. That was God's long-suffering. Not only affording Noah an opportunity to build the ark, but in my understanding, even in that context, he's talking about Christ through Noah preaching to those antediluvians giving them an opportunity to repent. There's the long-suffering of God. And if our understanding is correct from Genesis chapter 6, that was about 120 years. 120 years. And we certainly don't have time to read the prayer. It may be the longest recorded prayer in Scripture. I've never put that to the test. But over in Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 9, a prayer that was offered up by the Levites and, and other uh, religious leaders of that day. I mean, it begins over in Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse, um, verse 6, and it goes really to the end of the chapter. But as, as the priests, as the Levites were making their petition to God, they were rehearsing how that Throughout the ages, God's people had been so indifferent to what God had done for them, so, so rebellious sometimes, despite God's goodness to them. And so looking there in that prayer, Nehemiah chapter 9, look at verse 30. Yet many years didst thou forbear them. I want you to think about how many years we're talking about. You remember the nation of Israel? 
the ten tribes to the north. Friends, they, they, had, they didn't have one good king. I mean, their entire nation, th their entire history as a nation, as a group of people, would have been characterized by rebellion against God. And friends, there were some 19 kings. Just think about that. 19 kings. Think about the years that would have covered. And God did forbear them. He testified against them by his pro in the Spirit and His prophets. Yet they would not give ear. And therefore gave thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them. For thou art a gracious and merciful God. You know, even as God's people look back on their own history, what they saw was the patience of God. They saw the long-suffering of a loving God. And I hope that isn't lost on us. Those manifestations. Brother Robert in his prayer was talking about our nation. Ricky alluded to it in the upcoming 4th of July. And, you know, sometimes I, I stand in awe of God's long-suffering toward us as a nation. But that speaks to God's manifestations. He's not just says to be long-suffering. He doesn't just illustrate it. He has demonstrated it. He's demonstrated it. Throughout His dealings with mankind, even up to this day. But no doubt the crowning, the apex of the divine manifestation of God's long-suffering has to be Jesus and His coming to this earth. To kind of close this out, let me invite you to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and even though we might not encounter the word long-suffering and patience, I hope we appreciate what is being described here with regards to Romans chapter 5. Because we're supposed to be imitating God's love. A love that finds Him long-suffering and patient. And as we've discovered in his declaration, in the illustration, that is often to those who are very undeserving of it. And so when you come to the great manifestation of God's imitable patience of love, what do you find? You find God being loving and patient toward us when we least deserved it. And you remember how this is said in contrast to how man normally reacts. And think about that. We're talking about our imitating God's love and God's love and its patience and long-suffering is set in contrast to how man normally reacts, normally acts. And so there, notice what it says. Verse 6, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. There's the manifestation of God's love. There's the manifestation of God's patience and long-suffering. And to set that in contrast to how man normally Reacts under those circumstances, Paul says, Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even die. During our recent gospel seminar, <laughs> it's kind of telling, but one of the speakers was trying to, I think, impress upon us, you know, God's great love for us. And he asked, how many, how many wives out there knowing that their husbands were innocent but were on death row, how many of the wives would volunteer to take his place? And you know what? Even he was surprised by how few hands went up. And think about that. That's substituting your life for somebody that you love who you deem innocent. And he had very few takers of that. Again, maybe illustrative of, of what Paul's saying. How many people would die for a good man? For a righteous man? How many people would take somebody's life, or excuse me, take, take the place of somebody whose life was about to be taken? See, very few of us would. 
even for the best of people, even for people that we love. And yet Christ died for the ungodly. And then he further comments in verse 8, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Later he talks about, it, talks about it as when we were his enemies, he died for us. You see, friends, that's what makes this all the more challenging when I'm, I'm faced with that reality. That's the imitable patience of love that I'm supposed to be exhibiting. That's why Jesus tells me, love your enemies. And the world shakes its head and, and, and declares it's impossible, but in the imitable patience of love, we see it manifested in God's love for man. It's not like man's love. No. It's like God's love. And that's what we're called upon to imitate. We're to walk in His steps. And friends, again, when I think about God's patience of love, I don't have to think any further past myself. I know me better than anyone else. I know what I've done. I know who I am. And God sent Christ to die for me. For me. And that makes a very high bar, makes a very high measuring stick when I'm trying to imitate that. Now, I would be criminal by way of neglect if in talking about the patience of love and the imitable patience of God, not to at least remind us that God's patience will one day end. God is very long-suffering beyond what we can possibly maybe even understand. But God's patience one day will end. You remember when Jesus stood above Jerusalem and was weeping and cried out, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. See, there, there is the long-suffering of God. There is the patience of love seen in the, in the, the tears and in, in the the words of Jesus, but then he says, but now your house is left desolate. See, friends, God's long-suffering is remarkable to, to hear about and to see illustrated and certainly to see manifested, but we, we do have to face the reality that one day God's long-suffering will end. Peter explains, we should account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. While God is long-suffering, it is affording us an opportunity to be saved. But one day that will run out. Have you ever given any thought to that? That one day, a person hearing the invitation extended in, a, in an assembly like this, or maybe on a one-to-one -one Bible study, that person who is baptized for the forgiveness of their sins in the name of Christ, have you ever thought about it one time, once, Somewhere in the future, that will be the last person ever to appropriate the blood of Christ. You ever thought about that? That's the last one. God's long suffering will come to an end. And the thing is, none of us know when that time will be. Here's what we do know. As long as we have life, as long as we have all of our faculties, God in His long-suffering is affording us an opportunity to be saved. But when life is met in death, and incapacitation renders us no longer able to obey, for whatever reason, friends, someday God's long-suffering, even toward me, will end. It will end. When we talk about the imitable patience of God's love, I thought this was really telling. Uh, I read of this in uh, Brother uh, 
Brother Winkler's handbook on uh, heart diseases and their cure. And he offers this as uh, a real account, so I have no reason to believe otherwise, but uh, it had to do with a rather renowned agnostic. Uh, his name was Robert Ingersoll. I understand he lived during the late 1900s. He was a U.S. lawyer and also a lecturer. But he was really a proponent of agnosticism. In other words, he said you couldn't know whether or not God existed. But as it is reported on one occasion, he publicly defied God. He said, quote, I'll give God five minutes to strike me dead for the things I've said. And you can imagine at that day they would have had the vest with the, the watches. He pulled out his watch. He opened the face. And the report says that the, the crowd was just silent, breathless, waiting. It reported that there were some women who even fainted as the five minutes drew near to its close. After the five minutes elapsed, he closed his watch stuck it in his vest, and walked off. As though somehow he proved that God doesn't exist. A gospel preacher was in the audience and somebody asked him about it. And he, he made the great response. He said, did Ingersoll think he could exhaust the patience of the eternal God in five minutes? Maybe sometimes we underestimate the patience of God. Or we could dangerously overestimate it. But as we conclude our series, friends, what a great example for us to follow, right? What a very challenging example for us to follow. And so as I face that question once more, do I truly practice genuine agape love? It's easy to say yes. But it's far more difficult in reality to face the patience of love and what that looks like and what that demands of me. Am I long-suffering? Because if I'm not, then I really am not in a, in a position to say that I'm practicing true agape love. Because God is patient. God is love. Love is patient. It's long-suffering. So I trust, again, this is received in proper spirit. It was designed to help us all, beginning with Mike Brandt, to really face the responsibility I have to walk in love as a son of God, to be trying to imitate my father, my father who is love, and a God who has shown me what it looks like to practice the patience of love. You need to obey the gospel of Christ. Again, God in His long suffering has afforded you at least this, this opportunity today. Believe Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Him publicly and then be buried with Him in baptism for the forgiveness of those sins. And you have responded correctly to the long suffering of God. But let's say I have to do something by way of public confession or whatever it might be to, to be right as a child of God or or to have sins forgiven. And I'm banking on God's long suffering to continue beyond this occasion. Well, now I have shown despite toward the long suffering of God. Failed to understand what it's all about. It's God giving me an opportunity. And when I, when I squander that opportunity, I have failed to understand His long suffering toward me. If we can help you in any way, let us know what we stand.